So the first thing we need to do is establish the meaning of the word holy. The meaning of the word holy. I, I have been around church for a long time and I found out that one of the challenges with the modern day believer, the Christian in modern day, is that we use many words that we don't even know what it means. The Christian does not take the time, does not have the discipline required to carefully study scriptures to understand the meanings of the things that are related to our faith. So for instance, if you meet a, meet a believer on the road and you ask them, for instance, what is the meaning of redemption? What does it mean to be redeemed, for instance? The person could have been born again five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. And the person might not, most likely, especially with the modern day believer, be able to theologically, that is through the Bible, step by step, reveal to you what it means to be redeemed. What is the meaning of consecration? What is the meaning of sanctification? What is the meaning of the basic concepts of our faith? So part of what God does when we come to conferences like this is to, first of all, generate in our hearts a desire to know God as he has revealed himself in scriptures. So for instance, I need to tell you quickly, it doesn't matter how long you have been in church. If you are not a Christian, that is given to Bible study, you will, you will never know God. You need to understand that God, the concept of God, 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 the person God, he's a mystery. And the only way you are going to know God is by personal experience. You are not going to know God because you attend church. You are not going to know God because you are a regular attendant in church. There's nothing wrong with attending church. Don't hear what I did not say. The Bible is clear that we should not forsake the assembly of the brethren. But that you attend church is not a guarantee that you will know God. If you are going to know God, there must be a personal discipline in your life to study scriptures. Because the way God reveals himself to man is first through the Bible, through the word of God. So if you do not read the Bible, if you do not study the Bible, if you do not make it a priority in your life to give the Bible its place in your Christian journey, your relationship with God will be shallow. All you will know about God is what you heard from the mouth of a preacher. You will never know God on a personal level. The way to know God on a personal level is that you must discipline yourself to accept his introduction that he provides to you through scriptures. The reason many Christians have been immature since they got born again is that they are running their Christian lives on prophetic declarations. You cannot grow by prophecy. Prophecy is for comfort. Prophecy is for edification, but prophecy is not for spiritual growth. The Bible is very clear that if you are going to grow, you must desire the sincere milk of what? The word of God. Go around Christian space. I've been preaching, I've been in ministry over 15 years, and I can, I can tell you this thing authoritatively. One of the least attended services in the body of Christ is Bible study. Christians don't like Bible study. There are some who like prayer. So once it's prayer, they will come. But once you say, let's sit down and study the Bible, they will not come. The Christian has been raised in such a funny way. He's a spiritual kwashoko. He, his, his Christian life is like caricature. He has been raised in such a funny way that he thinks he can survive in his Christian life without a personal discipline to Bible study. He thinks he can survive without the word of God. He just wants to come to church and they say, next week, God will give you money. Next month, God will get you married. Next year, you will live like that. You will be a perpetual babe. And the problem with being a babe in Christ 
is that in the day of war, you will be meat for the devil. In the day of war. Bible scholars tell us that in the days of Paul, if Paul came into your city, Paul can teach scriptures from morning to night. Sometimes he does Bible study 10 hours. It was in one of those Bible studies that he was doing that a young man called Eutychus was sitting on the window. He had become so tired, the Bible study don't to take. He fell asleep and fell from the window and died. Bible study. Right now, we are even, we are even looking for technologies on how to make the service shorter. People are telling us that you don't keep people in church for too long. The same people that can't stay in church for too long, they can gist for eight hours. In fact, if the service closes at 11 a.m., some of them will hang around the church. T5. Just in. What happened? But when they're inside church, they're looking at clock. The message don't to take. The message don't to take. As if they have something important to do. They want to watch TV. They want to eat beans. They want to gist. They want to laugh. They don't care about the world. That's why in our personal spiritual lives, the average Christian is shallow and a babe. He doesn't know God. Paul taught Eutychus fell from the window and died. Go and read it in the book of Acts. He died. There was no panic in the building. Nobody shouted. Hey! They left him to die. When Paul was ready, he came down from Bible study, went to meet Eutychus where he was and said, Eutychus, arise. You don't to sleep. He brought him back from the dead. They did not put it in the news. The Bible says they, con they went back and they continued Bible study. It was normal for the dead to be raised. Why was there so much power available in that generation? Because men knew God. The essence of this conference is to tell you quickly that if you don't discipline yourself with the word, you will never know God. And one of the things that the word of God will show you is that relationship and fellowship with God is impossible without a character that is called holiness. What the word of God will do is introduce you to God. Show you that this is what God is like. This is how God thinks. This is how God relates with men. This is how God shows himself to men. So when you are reading stories in the Bible, it's not a storybook to get you excited. It's a pathway. It's a template. It's a protocol. For how God relates with men. So when you are reading about Moses, what God is showing you is, this is how I deal with men. When you are reading about Elijah, he's showing you, this is how I deal with men. So that when you know how he deals with men, you can pattern your life to enter into the same dealings. God is not partial. I want you to hear what I'm saying tonight. God does not have favorites. What God has is intimates. What you get from God is not a matter of favoritism. What you get from God is a matter of proximity. What do I mean? If you look at two Christians and you see that one of the Christians, they are enjoying their work with God. It seems as if they pray one second, God has answered. The difference between the two is how close they are to God. If your intimacy is deeper than your brother, your experience of God will be deeper than your brother. It's a matter of proximity. This is why in the Old Testament, because Christ had not yet died, they needed to develop a temporary technology for man to be able to engage God. One, man could not engage God because God, one, is a spirit. God is not mortal man. You cannot relate with God on the basis of your physical senses. So for them to be able to relate with God, there had to be a physical infrastructure that will allow them to be able to do business with a God that is spirit. Two, man could not relate with God because God is 
holy. He's holy. And man was corrupted by sin, afflicted by contamination that came from the sin that Adam committed in the garden of Eden. So God drove man from Eden. He didn't just drive him from the garden. Go and read it in Genesis chapter 3. The Bible says man was driven from where? The presence of God. Are you with me? Don't, you see, the Eden was just an infrastructure in the spirit to create a physical location where man and God could meet. And that meeting was possible as long as man had not contaminated himself. The minute man contaminated himself, God drove him from where? His presence. So every human being that is born into this world is born outside of that presence. That is why when you die, the reward in heaven is not a car. The reward in heaven is not the mansion. The reward in heaven is to be eternally present with God forever. You will be restored to the old Eden, but this will be a new Eden. The Bible calls it the new Jerusalem. We are going to sit with God. The Bible says we will see him as he is. Nothing hidden, nothing covered. You are brought back at your death. If you die as a believer that has served God faithfully, you are brought back into the presence where Adam was driven out of. So in the Old Testament, they needed to create a technology. Stay with me tonight. I'm just trying to build so that, you see, you see if the word of God does not go, the spirit of God will not come. So I have to teach. Now what did they do? God gave them a pattern. He spoke to Moses. He said, build me a house that I may what? Dwell amongst you. So God needed a physical structure that could trap his presence so that he could do business with man. Why? God is spirit and God is what? Holy. So Moses built the tabernacle. In that tabernacle, there were different levels. You had the outer court, you had the inner court, you had the what? Holy of Holies. Indicative of the fact that everybody who approaches God will not approach God at the same level. Some Christians still today are in outer court. Some have progressed into the inner court. The highest height of Christian life is when you are doing business with God where? In the Holy of Holies. Those are levels of intimacy. And when you read your Bible, you will find out that in the outer court, nothing supernatural ever happens in the outer court. In the inner court, you have some supernatural experiences. But in the Holy of Holies, you come in, in contact with God himself. In the Holy of Holies, you come in contact with God. This is to tell you that the closer you are to God, the greater the dimensions of him you will experience in your personal life. But you are not going to be able to draw that close to God if you do not understand the dimension of God that is called his what? Holiness. Give me Leviticus 11. 44 and 45. Leviticus 11. Do we have it on screen or I should use my Bible? Okay. Leviticus 11, 44 and 45. Just stay with me. We must teach. 11, 44 and 45. Okay. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore do what? And ye shall be what? For I. Let's stop first. What Jesus, I mean, God is saying here is that He wants His holiness to become your holiness. He says. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves 
and ye shall become holy for I am holy. What God is simply saying there is, if you are going to do business with me, first thing is that you must what? Sanctify yourself. Second thing is, you must be what? Holy. You must be holy. He says, the reason I am demanding sanctification and holiness from you is because I am holy. So the number one strength of being holy is that it is holiness that guarantees fellowship and intimacy with God. If you don't meet that minimum requirement, you will never go deep with God. Never. Never. And I'm not trying to be a bad man. It's scriptures. You can never go deep with God if you do not meet the requirements of holiness. This thing that God was telling them in Leviticus, he was telling them when he had brought them out of Egypt. Now that you have come out of Egypt, now that you are born again, the first requirement, the first thing I want to give you is not a breakthrough. It's myself. 